I'm Dr. Archila Gunaseka Raphael, the Assistant Editor of the Journal of Indo-Pacific Affairs and Senior Event Planner for the Consortium of Indo-Pacific Researchers. On behalf of these two organizations, I would like to welcome you to the roundtable discussion, the Myanmar Crisis, Obstacles, Opportunities and Observations. On 1 February 2021, a day before the parliament was to swear in, members elected in the country's free and fair 2020 election, the Tamadao Myanmar's military deposed the democratically elected members of the country's ruling party, the National League for Democracy. The country's acting president declared a year-long state of emergency and transferred power to Commander-in-Chief of Defense Services, Ming Lai. The junta declared the results of the November 2020 general election invalid and stated its intent to hold the new election at the end of the state of emergency. The Tamadao has detained many of the democratic leaders, protested erupted, and the junta has met all resistance with a brutal crackdown, leaving hundreds, perhaps thousands, dead and many others wounded, jailed or in hiding. Our discussion will focus on the past, present and future of this ongoing situation. However, before we begin, I must read the following disclaimer. The views and opinions expressed or implied in this roundtable are those of the participants and should not be construed as carrying the official sanctions of the Department of Defense, Department of the Air Force, Air Education and Training Command, Air University or other agencies or departments of the US government for their international equivalence. Now, allow me to introduce our distinguished panel. Ambassador Scott Martial. Ambassador Martial is a career diplomat currently serving as a visiting scholar, visiting practitioner fellow on Southeast Asia at Stanford University's Walter Scherenstein Air Pacific Research Center. He served as ambassador to Myanmar from 2016 to 2020, leading a mission of 500 employees during the difficult Rohingya crisis and challenging time for Myanmar's democratic transition and the United States-Myanmar relationship. Prior to serving in Myanmar, Ambassador Martial served as Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for East Asia and the Pacific at the Department of State, where, where he oversaw US relations with Southeast Asia. From 2010 to 2013, he served as US Ambassador to Indonesia. Prior to that, he served concurrently as the first U.S. Ambassador for ASEAN Affairs and Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Southeast Asia from 2007 to 2010. Then we have Dr. Mimi Winbert. Dr. Bird retired from the U.S. Army after 28 years of distinguished services, service. Highlights of her military career include serving as the Deputy Economic Advisor, Civil Military Operations Plans Officer, and Interagency Operations Officer as Pacific Command in support of Operation Enduring Freedom. She also served as a linguist and cultural advisor to the US delegations attending the ASEAN Regional Forum POW MIA Recovery negotiations in Myanmar and Operation Caring Response to Cyclone Nagris and U.S.-Myanmar Human Rights Dialogues. Dr. Bird joined the Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies in 2007, where she researches, teaches, and publishes in the area of U.S.-Myanmar relations, security dynamics in Southeast Asia, economics and security linkages, and related topics. Then we have Mr. Pawan Amin. Mr. Amin is a PhD candidate and research scholar at the Chinese Studies Program, Center for East Asian Studies at the School of International Studies, Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi, India. He completed his master's in geopolitics and international relations from Manipal Academy of Higher Education. 
His research interests include China's approach to the Middle East and its implications for foreign policy dynamics. He has contributed to Fed forms such as the Diplomat and the Policy Forum. Dr. Charles Duns, Dr. Mr. Sorry about that. <laughs> I just promoted you to doctor. Mr. D uh, Charles Duns. Uh, Mr. Duns is an associate with Eurasia Group's Global Macro Practice, where he focuses on Chinese foreign policy and the geopolitics of Southeast Asia and the Indo-Pacific. He's also a visiting scholar at the East West Center in Washington and a contributing editor of American Purpose, uh, Francis Fukuyama's magazine. A former foreign correspondent in Southeast Asia, he has reported from the regional region for outlets including the New York Times, the Atlantic, the Los Angeles Times, and foreign policy. Then we have Mr. Tom Connolly, Mr. Connolly is a current MA student at King's College London, based in Melbourne, Australia. He has a long-standing interest in security and terrorism and the importance of multilateral institutions. He graduated with a BA from University of Melbourne in 2017 with a double major in history and politics. Tom later received a bursary to undertake a summer intensive at Rothberg International School, Hebrew University, Jerusalem, which examined the evolution and ideological discourse of contemporary Islamist movements. Following this, Tom undertook language study in Cairo and served as a risk analyst at the Australia, Australian based Foreign Brief. He's currently a non resident Bessie Fellow at the Pacific Forum and a researcher, editor for the Consortium of Indo-Pacific Researchers. And then we have Dr. Indu Sakshina. Dr. Sakshina is the Deputy Director of the Consortium of Indo-Pacific Researchers. She has published articles and commentary in journals and newspapers. She has also presented her papers at international conferences and seminars. She, she's a graduate in global affairs from Rutgers University, New Jersey. Her research interests include international relations theory, international security, terrorism and counterterrorism, and South Asia's geopolitics. And our moderator for today's event is Dr. Ernest Gunasekar Rathwell, editor in chief of the Journal of Indo Pacific Affairs and director of the Consortium of Indo Pacific Researchers. Dr. Gunasekar Rathwell, the floor is yours. Thank you for that nice introduction of everyone. Um, I, I'm not going to take a whole, a whole lot of time because you guys are so accomplished that your uh, bi biographies themselves take up a considerable amount of time. Uh, so I'm going to turn it over to uh, uh, the panelists, uh, starting with uh, Ambassador Marcial. If you'll just tell us a little bit about the, either the, the article that you wrote for our special issue uh, that came out last month or, or something, uh, a pressing issue that, that you would want to tackle for today. Yeah, I'll give you about five or seven minutes uh, for, e for each of you, and then we'll dive into questions. So I'll turn it over to you, Ambassador. Thanks very much. Um, I'll try to be brief. Um, after the coup in, on February 1st, uh, and since the coup, really, um, there's been a number of foreign analysts and, and officials who have argued that the top model, the, the name of the Myanmar military, is A, one of the few effectively functioning institutions in the country, and B, an essential institution in a country with a lot of centrifugal forces in conflict. And so bottom line, their argument has been that um, as, as Myanmar moves ahead and tries to tackle this crisis, it'll be important uh, and necessary to maintain this institution, the military, and for it to have a prominent role. And, and I felt there was a need to really rebut this argument, uh, which is why I wrote the article. Um, you can argue, one can argue about whether Myanmar needs a military, uh, but not this military. Um, the military has largely been in control of the country since 1962, with a few exceptions. And during that time, they've done about as bad a job of governing as anyone, any institution anywhere in the world. They've they drove the country into the ground. And I don't mean just human rights abuses and lack of democracy, although 
those were very serious problems. They drove the economy into the ground, were involved in wide scale corruption, resource exploitation, and actually exacerbated the divisions, the, the very real ethnic divisions in the country. Mm -hmm. So for most of its history, the Tatma Dao has been a negative force, has actually harmed uh, the country. Um, and it continues to do so today, obviously, with this coup. So the notion that this is some kind of essential institution needed to hold the country together, that's what the Tatma Dao would like everybody to believe. But I think the history and the current behavior uh, of the military in Myanmar shows that's actually not the case. Um, and the, related to this has been a lot of discussion about the need for a dialogue to, to resolve this. And, you know, as a diplomat, we always favor dialogue. And at some point, there's going to need to be some kind of talks. But at this point, A, the junta has shown no interest in any kind of serious dialogue, has, has basically just blown off efforts by ASEAN and others to try to mediate, um, continues to murder people, arrest people, uh, and act with tremendous brutality. Um, so they're not showing any interest in dialogue. And my sense um, is that the overwhelming majority of the Myanmar people are not interested in dialogue at this point now because they don't want the military in power. And it's not something that they're willing to negotiate. So my view continues to be that the, um, the best hope um, over the medium term is that the pressure on the military, mostly internally, but some externally, um, continues to grow. And at some point enough officers realize that they're gonna be unable to govern, unable to restore stability to this country. And therefore they will look for a way out. And at that point, perhaps it's possible and necessary to begin some kind of internal dialogue, but not until that point. Longer term, and, and uh, Colonel Byrd's more of an expert on the Myanmar military than I am, so she may want to talk about this, but um, I think there's a need to fundamentally restructure and reform the military. The military, as, as it has been for so long, is in effect a cancer uh, in the country. It, it is, the country has no chance of success with the military continuing as it has been and as it is today. It's up for the Myanmar people to figure out how to restructure. That's not my call, but that's, that's gonna be an essential element. And the reason this is important right now, particularly for foreign audiences to understand, is to, for us to avoid this sort of sometimes easy thing of calling for a, a dialogue with the military, with the idea that the military kind of goes back to the way it was pre-coup. I think that's a non-starter. Uh, and that's, again, not my call. That's up to the Myanmar people to decide. But to recognize that the, the coup has prompted not just opposition, but widespread, really, a national resistance from a population that really sees the military almost like a foreign occupying force with no legitimacy, no credibility, and almost no popular support. This is not your run-of-the-mill coup where maybe 30 or 40 percent of the country might be okay with it. This is, should be viewed as basically a foreign occupying force facing widespread national resistance. Um, and it's probably not gonna get, things are not gonna get better anytime soon, sadly. Um, I'll start, stop there and uh, wanna hear from the other panelists. Thank you. Thank you, sir. That's a very bleak picture. Um, and I, I don't think it's gonna get any prettier as we, as we move through the other speakers. Uh, Dr. Wynn, uh, Dr. Bird, would you uh, talk a little bit about your paper and, and maybe uh, build upon what, what uh, the ambassador had to say? Uh, you're, you're muted. Thank you very much. I'm really honored to be a part of this panel. I, and I wanted to tag on a little bit to uh, Ambassador Marcio said about military, but I'm sure the, and, and, and other will fill in with the China piece. But I wanted to uh, say that the military has a uh, uh, belief in, in a way that the belief that they are better at managing China, right? But in reality, when you start to look back at it under the military rule, uh, they have negotiated badly with China. 
And, and so, but they continue to be a myth inside the military. But I think that people see it differently. People see it differently because their isolationist policies and you know uh, their isolation from the, the rest of the world has uh, uh, give them a very little uh, ability to uh, negotiate with China. So you know um, there's a myth out there that they are they are a better one. But uh, my my topic here, I wanted to stay true to my the chapter that I wrote was I wanted to bring out the uh, from this crisis a very specific dimension of women. The role of women, and Ambassador Marcel was talking about the entire you know, population that rise up. And of course, Myanmar actually has more than half, a little bit more than half is women. You know? And this time they are very much involved. And not only they're involved, they're taking the leading role, which is unusual, for the Myanmar women, you know? And this has to do with 10 years of opening. This is the benefit of 10 years of opening and engagement and education. You know, uh, they, they, their eyes are wide open and they are now, they believe that this situation is related to them. In the past, especially political and security issue, the women are made to believe within the community, uh, from cultural perspective that that is not their role. It's not their place, you know? They may play a little bit of supportive role, but never out front in, in, in this level of magnitude, you know, leading. Uh, and, and so that's what gave me hope though. You know, I, I, it's not all lost. This involvement of the women brought more commitment, more, uh, more uh, creativity and courage, you know, to this fight. So uh, this may be the, you know, the, you know, uh, 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 this may, their involvement may be the, the needed element to push them over the tipping point, over the tipping point, right? So, and, and what, some of the example, um, you know, when I was interviewing various people, whenever women leader come and talk to me, they have, they're more organized they seem to have a lot more realistic and pragmatic view of what they are seeing. Whereas then when the young, you know, the, the, the male young leaders come to, you know, when I interview them, they're a lot more emotional and they wanted to just kill them, kill them, kill them. Whereas the women seem to be, so that seems to be, I think they're complementing, uh, uh, complementary capability to, the, uh, to the, this uh, resistance movement. So I just wanted to bring in the uh, maybe a little bit of optimism as well as um, a different different view, different perspective to this uh, uh, this uh, resistance movement. Thank you. I think I'm going to stop there. Thank you, Dr. Burton. It, it's good. It's good to hear that there's at least some a degree of hope out there. Uh, Mr. Amin, I'm going to turn it over to you next. Uh, speak a little bit to what, what's already been brought up, or or just focus on your article either way. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lapwe, um, and thank you, Joan Lapwe, and the President of SOD, Ms. Washington. And I find myself in the minority of one since I'm going to talk. I'm going to be talking about the benefits of uh, keeping relations with the Tatmadaw. So I hope uh, I, I hope you indulge me and uh, on this. Um, so the paper I co-authored with Dr. Torangba uh, is titled "Myanmar and U.S.'s Indo-Pacific Strategy and Why Is China Winning and What to Do About It." So my recommendations are purely based on this particular perspective. So we attempted to look at U.S.'s policy priority in Myanmar and situate that in U.S.'s larger strategic objective in the region. To that end, we surmise that given Tatmadaw's political position in Myanmar, it will be difficult for U.S. to develop a healthy bilateral relation without developing a working relationship with the Tatmadaw. And it is in U.S.'s larger strategic interest to have a Myanmar which if it does not help U.S. interests, at least doesn't hurt U.S. interests in the region. So there are four key questions which sort of summarize the arguments we are making. First one, what is the focus of U.S.'s Indo-Pacific strategy? What has been U.S.'s foreign policy priority in Myanmar? Should Myanmar feature in U.S.'s Indo-Pacific strategy? And what are the opportunity costs of not integrating Myanmar? And how can Myanmar be co-opted in U.S.'s Indo-Pacific strategy? So, uh, Talking about U.S.'s Indo-Pacific strategy, uh, strategically, the Indo-Pacific can be seen as a realization of U.S.'s structural necessity to balance the increasing influence of China across the Indo-Pacific region. 
in an era which is not only has key us allies but ever since the second world war has seen numerous flashpoints be it the korean war vietnam war the taiwan strait crisis of tensions around the north korean nuclear program where china and us have come at loggerheads with each other either directly or otherwise so this region has been a zone of continuous cold rivalry only recently owing to increased material capability china has come to a position where it is beginning to actualize some of its strategic goals the first very visible sign that washington was going cognizant of this uh, challenge came in 2001 uh when uh, secretary condoleezza rice wrote an article in foreign affairs where she uh spoke about the need to uh, focus us's diplomatic attention towards china however 911 and subsequent global war on terror took the us's focus away from that strategic uh contestation it was only in 2009 when uh, under uh, president obama's administration where there was a call to refocus or to reassess us's myanmar strategy and look at if sanctions were the right way to go about it. so what has us's foreign policy priorities been in myanmar so far uh, it has been about uh, promoting democracy in the country and to that end focusing only on reinstating the national league for democracy and suchi to power um well should myanmar be in us's indo pacific strategy uh, we argue that us us has a c bias when it comes to indo pacific and at least in the obama administration the focus has been in two regions primarily the south china sea and the east china sea conflicts even there the focus has been more on the littoral states in the region and us has by and large ignored its bilateral relationship with the non littoral states were stakeholders in the conflict and that is precisely what china has capitalized on so there is a there is a, a there is something for us to gain from uh, improving its bilateral relations with myanmar and that will not happen unless it starts having a, 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 at least a working relationship with atmadoc what are the opportunity costs of not integrating myanmar um well dr thorang bam is actually a professor of mine he taught me uh, strategies and negotiations in my masters so you so often speak about how it's imperative to maximize your minimum gains and minimize your maximum losses when you're in a difficult situation and presently us does not have a lot of leverages in myanmar so what happens is china is able to use its own political and economic leverages to wither the asean consensus so if us is serious about uh, following through on uh, its own commitment to uh, reduce china's influence in the region getting a country like myanmar back into its fold becomes important and there again the takmada was willing to align away from china um uh, to that end they become actually a reliable partner for the us because it was not if it were not for senior general than shui who in 2008 2009 actually pushed tianjin to go for a, a democratic transition we would not have seen the democratic tran- the democratic transition in myanmar that we witnessed in the last 10 years so the military itself is instrumental to this process um so uh, can the us uh, actually co-opt myanmar uh, well if the optics are to be uh, taken into account it's difficult for us to be seen as officially conducting bilateral relations but as anybody in china studies know their diplomacy doesn't necessarily stop in such situations i mean we are aware that back in 1989 after the tiananmen crisis when us could not have official relations with the ministry of uh, foreign affairs of china they still continued continued man, uh, maintaining their diplomatic relations with the central office of foreign affairs that's my time thank you very much if you have any questions i'll be happy to do thank you thank you sir and we will definitely get back to you uh, and and now we see we have some differing perspectives uh and i'm going to turn it over to mr dunce now to give him give his perspective Great, thank you very much. So, kind of off the bat, I think one of the main points that I want to make is that Myanmar's coup remains really incomplete. So, you have a ton of officials, diplomats, police, and even soldiers who have pushed back against or even defected from the military. And I think the the most prominent example of this is Myanmar's ambassador to the United Nations, who continues to side with pro democracy demonstrators, but he refuses to stand down. And I think a helpful thing here is that. ASEAN's response has unfortunately been far less brave. Its member states are far from united, but on the whole, none are willing to actually stand up to the Tatmadaw or stand up for the Suu Kyi government. 
So you essentially have ASEAN, ASEAN's member states allowing Myanmar's uh, incomplete coup to drag on, all while offering the Taliban to undeserved legitimacy by allowing Min Aung Wing and other representatives of the government to join and speak at official meetings. Uh, one real problem here is that by accepting the Tat Madaw on the grounds of non-interference, which is a firm ASEAN commitment, this notion of not interfering in a country's internal affairs, kind of letting them do what they do internally, the bloc is undermining both Southeast Asia's stability. I mean, think what's going to happen as more refugees continue to flow out of Myanmar and when the country kind of continues to become a hotbed for further illicit activity, whether that be drug production or whatnot. And it's also undermining the region's geopolitical ambitions. Second point is really the focus of my article. My, my point overall is that with ASEAN allowing the junta to take Myanmar's seat at ASEAN, the body will struggle to bring the human rights wary United States to the table, especially with the Biden administration, which has made human rights kind of a very, very strong point within the State Department and has emphasized the importance of human rights throughout not only the Asia Pacific or the Indo-Pacific, but the world as well. So I think a very specific problem here is that if Biden refuses to attend ASEAN events because top model leaders are there, it will leave Southeast Asian countries to engage the Americans on a bilateral basis, which disadvantages the smaller and less powerful countries of Southeast Asia who intend to sit, shape their collective future without relying on China or the United States with perhaps the exception of, uh, of Cambodia, which is extremely kind of pro-China at this point. But Southeast Asians broadly know that they need both the Chinese and the Americans to be present and engaged. But if ASEAN further legit, further legitimizes the Tatmada, the bloc really does risk drive away, driving away the United States. I think a, a helpful example of this is back in the George W. Bush presidency. He repeatedly kind of throughout held ASEAN at arm's length because it included Myanmar's previous junta uh, in hosted events. At, at one ASEAN event, for instance, Bush refused to sit at the same table as Tatmada leaders. At other events, he sent Condoleezza Rice's deputy um, because having Condoleezza, the Secretary of Rice, attend, Secretary of State attend, or the President attend, was granting the Taliban too much legitimacy. So far, uh, Biden's Secretaries of State and Defense have taken part in virtual ASEAN events at which Taliban officials represented Myanmar. I think really by necessity, I think there's an understanding of the need to engage ASEAN primarily to kind of combat Chinese influence in the region is more important for the Biden administration than the, the Myanmar coup specifically. But I, I will say they engage with ASEAN and they engage with the Tatmada begrudgingly, and they use their platforms to denounce the junta and demand uh, demand ASEAN action. I would be surprised if President Biden has ever will ever allow himself to kind of be in the Tatmada's presence. He has not so far. And if they're at the ASEAN Regional Forum or the East Asia Summit, which they, they probably will be, one should wager that Biden will not be there and that he will send a lower level official to signal his displeasure with ASEAN. Ultimately then, ASEAN's commitment to non-interference risks alienating the United States at a moment when the bloc really cannot afford to do so. I mean, ASEAN right now needs to engage the United States on areas of mutual concern, whether that's securing more American-made COVID vaccines or countering China in the South China Sea. To do so though, they're going to have to address the Myanmar crisis in one way or another. I mean, if ASEAN wants to shape Southeast Asia's future in Southeast Asians' interests by working both with the United States and China, rather than simply relying on the latter, the bloc's leaders need to wake up to Biden's reality, frankly, and display some form of political bravery that they, they so far lacked. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it there, but I'm looking forward to answering questions. Thank you, Mr. Dunst. That's quite enlightening. Uh, now we'll turn to uh, Mr. Connolly uh, for his perspective and uh, turn it over to you. Thank you, Dr. Rockwell. Um, firstly, I'd like to thank you for putting the event together and to all of my co-panelists uh, for all your fascinating insights so far. Um, thank you for everybody for taking the time to attend this event. Uh, so in my article, I essentially discuss um, civilians being pushed to armed resistance, whether it be in the cities or in the countryside. Um, I think it is very much true that protests in the countryside uh, we're given a little bit more time to protest uh, initially after the coup uh, as compared to the cities. Um, however, I think this is, it's fair to say that this is in large part due to the ferocity and resilience of the protests in the cities and the uh, junta's preoccupation with suppressing protests in the city. Um, in, the, in the city landscape, um, tactics uh, as compared to the countryside varied significantly. It is very much true that in the countryside they were given a large degree of latitude initially um, and they were allowed to unfold with uh, less immediate crackdowns. Um, however, as the death toll did 
continue to rise throughout the countryside, communities did begin to organize themselves to resist security forces. And when protesters began to be arrested in their areas, they were much more prepared uh, to retaliate. In my article, I lay out a number of predisposing factors that have been advantageous to uh, civilian defence organisations. Um, for example, in areas where there have been existing militias or armed ethnic groups, or where there's been strong traditions of hunting. Um, but one of the key factors that we that has been identified so far has been, you know, regions where there has been. Uh, a lack of tapment or infrastructure, weaponry or intelligence capacity. Um, civilian uh, armed ethnic groups were have utilized uh, ambushes and attacks on military and police. Um, for example, there was a notorious attack in Tamu Township where uh, that began with the killing of a protester on the 25th of March. Uh, in response to this, locals formed the Tamu Security Group, TSG, uh, and began stockpiling rifles and creating uh, improvised explosive devices. Uh, in this instance, um, as has been seen throughout the countryside, uh, this group was able to use the, their knowledge of terrain to carry out sort of guerrilla style attacks on security forces. And reportedly, and admittedly, it is hard to extract um, data uh, on this, they have reportedly killed 15 members of the security forces. Um, now, there have been a number of trends that have been seen um, throughout the countryside. You would see civilians either forming People's Defence Forces, uh, PDFs, or they would join with established uh, ethnic armed groups, EAOs. Um, for example, uh, the Chinland Defence Force was formed around early April um, as a merger of various resistance cells uh, throughout Chin State, um, or civilian defence forces would join with established uh, armed ethnic groups. Uh, an example of this would be the Karenian Nationalities Defence Force, the KNDF, uh, which was formed in May, which actually incorporated uh, three Karenian state-based PDFs uh, two PDFs in Chan State and a number of ethnic armed organisations. Um, it's important to note that ethnic armed organisations in Myanmar have varying intentions and are of varying size. Uh, they're not a monolithic uh, establishment by any means. You know, for example, the Iraqi army, they're you know, a reasonably new group as compared to some of these EAOs. Um, they've been involved in intense fighting recently and they do see the advantage of you know, some degree of accommodation with the military junta um, and extending the current ceasefire, which was extended in April, to enable it to regroup and consolidate control of its areas. Um, you know, and this varies wildly to you know, what you'd see in the Karen National Union or Kachin Independence Organization, which are you know, some of the largest and most, most politically significant organizations. Um, and have been known to provide sanctuary and training to fleeing distance from the cities. Um, but at the same time, they also understand having to, the balance between providing the support to dissidents from the city and the likely um, attacks against the regime for, for doing so. Um, and in my article, I also discussed the impacts of COVID-19 and what many observers have described, the weaponization of the pandemic. Um, unfortunately, it does seem to be so that uh, the Tatum Dillard has used COVID-19 as a, as a tool for greater control of the, civilized, of the civilian population. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic has been particularly acute in, in Myanmar. Uh, I think there's been over 42, uh, yeah, 420,000 cases of COVID-19 and over 16,000 deaths. Um, however, many inside Myanmar and outside you know, warn that these numbers are severely underreported um, and only deaths at medical facilities are actually being recorded in the national toll. So these numbers are likely to be much, much higher. Um, you know, these are accentuated, all of the problems that are associated with this are accentuated by the SAC's weaponization of the pandemic. Um, all throughout its stay in power, uh, the junta has deliberately obstructed life-saving care to COVID-19 patients. Uh, they've actually banned the private sale of oxygen to civilians.
the oxygen cylinders uh, and block civilians from actually refilling them. Um, on top of this, uh, due to the involvement of some medical workers in the nationwide civil disobedience movement, uh, over 150 doctors and nurses have actually been arrested. Uh, and as of July, the Tamador has been recorded to have committed about 240 attacks on healthcare workers. Um, and on top of this, it has also uh, raided and looted community run clinics. And on July 16, uh, security forces actually posed as COVID-19 patients uh, to entrap and arrest uh, medical volunteers. Um, yeah, unfortunately, and 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 consistently uh, with the Tatmadaw's uh, stated goal and actions, um, the the pandemic has been effectively weaponized uh, to privilege the rank and file of sort of uh, the Tatmadaw uh, to the at the expense of Myanmar's civil and civilian populace. Um, some observers have suggested that maybe the pandemic could deal you know some sort of a serious blow to the regime but i think this appears to be particularly unlikely um especially given the fact that uh the tatmador is always on always looking for a way to privilege its membership at the expense of its dissidents um there's been i think last month britain warned the un security council that almost half of myanmar's population could be infected with the disease within a matter of weeks um, there has been some degree of international support. I think earlier this year, the Australian government uh, pledged five million to Myanmar. Um, but many fear, you know, rightfully so. I think this money, which is to be channeled through ASEAN, um, will essentially fall into the hands of the Tatmadaw. So, uh, with that, I would like to leave my presentation there, and I'd like to get into the Q and A and field any questions you guys might have. Thank you, Tom. That says some very interesting stuff there. Uh, now we're going to turn to our last panelist, uh, Dr. Sakshina, and she's going to fill us in on her insights, and then we'll open it up for questions after that. Indu? Thank you, Doc. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you uh, to the Journal of Indo-Pacific Affairs uh, for giving me the opportunity to be a part of this fantastic panel. Uh, uh, I would uh, like to tell the brief about like uh, when I started working on the Myanmar, it was in 2019 that I wrote my first paper on Rohingya crisis and the assessment of uh, the pillar third of responsibility to protect. So uh, like I was a bit uh, optimistic uh, when the, there was in December 2019, there was a uh, hearing of International Court of Justice again to the military regime. And uh, uh, when the 2019 UN International Fact-Finding Mission submitted its report of genocidal intent, uh, but the end result was not uh, uh, so fruitful. And again, then in the election in November 2020, uh, not only me, but it was uh, uh, everyone was hoping that it's a good sign for the democratic process and it's a, it's a victory of the Burmese people. But uh, at sudden, the table turns and the military captured, controlled the uh, government and uh, put the political leaders in and the journalists uh, in, in imprisonment. And since then, we have been watching and witnessing what is happening in the Myanmar. So when I was writing my paper, this uh, the second paper on the security issue and the security trouble in the Southeast Asia, despite of the international condemnations, despite the sanctions, and despite the warnings from the global institutions, uh, I was wondering that how, how military junta is, has been surviving. Uh, so I contend in my paper that uh, unwavering support of uh, Russia and China uh, to military junta is, it makes it difficult to restore the democratic process and uh, re-establish peace and stability in the region. And I also uh, pointed out that, uh, that it propels the apprehension of the rise of autocracy in the region. So uh, I won't take much time and I would, uh, would like to take more on the questions. Thank you. Thank you, Indu. Uh, so I had, a, I had some prepackaged questions that I wanted to ask, but we've got one that, that came in that I think it demands immediate attention. 
and I'm, I'm not playing favorites just because it came from my wife either. Um, over the weekend, uh, Myanmar's shadow government composed of ousted democratically elected uh, parliamentarians launched a defensive war against the military junta, <laughs> propelling the conflict between the champions of democracy and the minions of autocracy into a new phase. Given the lack of external support to the democratic forces, does the resistance to the coup stand any chance of ousting the military and re restoring democracy? And I, I'm going to toss that out to, to Dr. Bird first, but then we'll, we'll open it up to everyone to get it to have a stab at it. Um, my, you know, I have been interviewed on that that question, and my response is that this time people power is higher than firepower. People power at this moment is in historically, we have never seen this level of resistance or uh, hatred for the military. And earlier, I think it was um, uh, Mr. Connolly said like uh, the weaponization of weaponization of COVID really further uh, motivated their disdain for the military. That's where the, instead of the military taking that opportunity to show how they care for the people, lives and welfare, they turn it around. So that really a bear to the, the entire country, what they thought about the people, you know? So that even increased their resolve that they cannot accept the military. So on the people side, you know, that, that, the the um the resolve and the power of people uh, you know based on any other study too when you have power of people they can always overcome power of uh, uh, firepower so i have uh, so you know i'm i'm not as pessimistic i'm more optimistic again you know earlier there are so many little things that are different than any other uprising before like i said like uh, women you know more than half the populations are very much engaged. They're not as spattering, they're not in support role. They, many of them are taking leadership roles. So all these little are different than the previous. So if you're looking at the history, um, uh, you know, uh, I, I don't think the history give us a good uh, uh, indication of what's going to happen in the future. And, and you know, China and Russia, they can support all they want. But if you don't have the hearts and minds of the, the majority of the population inside Myanmar, it's very hard to, uh, uh, I, I, I have a hard time seeing how it could be long-term successful. Thank you. Uh, Ambassador Marcial, you want to take a stab at it too? Um, thanks. Yeah, I mean, that's a really tough question. I, I think there's a difference between defeating the junta militarily, which is probably unlikely, um, and rather putting uh, massive pressure and causing massive strain on the military, which I think is beginning to happen. Um, and it's not only, um, I, I wouldn't overstate the importance of the NUG announcement over the weekend because the, the fact is there's been a lot of armed resistance going on for some time now and it's a combination of attacks against the military but also um, frankly assassinations of people associated with the junta um, and I think it's it's hard to see the top as I said being defeated militarily it's possible to see so much pressure and strain put on the junta over time that at some point um, uh, significant uh, senior officials in the military think, uh, realize that they should look for a way out. I'm not predicting that that happens, but I think it's a plausible scenario. Great. Uh, Mr. Connolly, you, you talk about the uh, the ethnic groups that have been you know, fighting against the central government uh, and the, the Tatmadaw uh, uh, for for some time. What role might they play in, in this, and what and what role have they, they played in in protecting perhaps you know some of these elements that are that are forming this shadow government? Yeah, that's a that's a really interesting question, um, and I also noted uh, Don Emerson's question. Uh, down in the chat box as well, which is kind of similarly related, sort of discussing how uh, ethnic armed groups might uh, contribute to a non bama uh, dominated uh, coalition, I suppose. Uh, and the role that ethnic armed groups uh, seem to play 
is really interesting and diverse, I suppose. I think it's important to note that each group uh, is seeking to maximise its personal its its personal gains and minimise its personal losses. And for different groups, this culminates differently. You know, as I noted before, the the AA have been fighting a very long, protracted, nasty insurgency in a Rakhine state, um, and they do see the advantages of um, of you know, some degree of accommodation with with the SAC, um, you know, more established ethnic uh, armed organizations um, are fiercely opposed. Um, they're very happy to shelter dissidents fleeing cities. Um, but at the same time, they're also acutely aware of the Tatmadaw's you know, long history, uh, very skilled, very broad skill set in counterinsurgency. So that is something they do need to weigh up. And a lot of these Ethnic armed organizations have had struggles within the Suki government as well, um, within Bama dominated politics. And so they do approach the national unity government with some degree of skepticism. So I suppose it's a long winded way of saying, you know, each group has its own uh, motivations and it does come down to a trade off between their own personal security and personal motivations and their you know, disdain for the military, which is entirely reasonable. <laughs> uh, I don't think anyone, uh, you know, would think that, especially uh, the way they have uh, weaponized the COVID-19 pandemic, nobody in Myanmar has any sympathy for the Tatum at all, but everyone is also acutely aware of how skilled they are in counterinsurgency. They've been, they've been doing that since independence in 48. Um, they've got very nasty, brittle tactics. Um, and I suppose that's something that each group has to weigh up for themselves. Great, uh, thank, thank you for that. Uh, anybody else wanna take a stab at this particular question? And I've got I a bunch more. I want to respond back to uh, Mr. Connolly on the, their skill and you know, counterinsurgency. In order for them to do that, they need soldiers. You know, they need soldiers and they're bleeding right now. We have never seen this level of defections. They are in thousands that are defecting, right? So in order for you to, and counterinsurgency is all about hearts and minds as well, right? And they are losing that war on hearts and minds. So I just don't know how they could turn it around to, to do that because they are losing their, Every battle, if you look at every battle, there's always kills rate on the, the military site is always higher than the other side, right? So they're losing people. And then of course, COVID has to kill them too, you know, because they haven't really, especially at the lower level, your trigger pullers, right? You have to, uh, and then uh, uh, they have these defections, right? All that's put together, they are losing and they have no way to replace it because they, they would have to go after the Gen Z age group to bring into the military to do that. And you're not going to have that. So I just don't see, I mean, they, they have air power, but air power is not a really counter. You just do the carpet bombing, right? You're not really that for some. So I just don't see how they could going forward, again, uh, a viability of their, their strategy as well as the Demiro as uh, ability to continue, right? So th that's my uh, 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 respond back to Mr. Connolly. Yeah. Uh, uh, on the matter of the, the defections, um, you know, are, are these folks just defecting into the countryside or are they actually, you know, lat latching on to, to the resistance? Uh, what, what, where, are the, where are they going? Uh, yeah, they're, they're all over. Uh, uh, and some of them are working with the, uh, the, 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 uh, the PDFs. Some of them are working with the, the, the uh, ethnic groups. Some of them are still inside providing information to the outside, you know, even if they don't physically come out. So uh, uh, there were, uh, you know, the, the, the figure of 2,500 was given, but it, they said that it probably isn't complete. This is, you know, based on uh, uh, they, they were able to count, but there are countless people that just left and never uh, heard from again. And then from those interview, you know, that has came out, they said there are thousands inside the military that still want to come out and finding a way. And, and some of them even said that, please start the battle so that we can leave, you know, because they are put into a very uh, quarantine situation, you know, they were 
um, in a, a, a controlled environment. They brought their families and everybody into the military bases and they're not allowed to leave. So it's very difficult for them to escape. So, um, so those are some of the things that, that has, uh, uh, during my interviews that I, I heard from the interviews. Great, thank you. Yeah, yeah I, I would like to add on Dr. Uh, Baird, the, what uh, she said, like, to, uh, uh, like uh, her, I'm also quite optimistic. Like that's a that's a people's movement that is uh, that is coming, and it's it's not from like a, a sponsor. It's coming from by their heart and by their mind. Like when we when we as an international relations student, when we uh, read the little heart, little uh, little heart, the the uh, strategist from England in 17th century. So what he said that uh, uh, winning heart and mind, winning winning the peace winning the peace, not winning the war. Winning the war is not the end result. So what, what we are seeing in the main, Myanmar, like the people, the, the a movement that, uh, that is making themselves capable and what, what the, we want, because now they have seen the big powers. Uh, in, in P5, the two big powers are supporting the military regime and the other powers that like they are just but uh, should say like the global institutions, like uh, that's mere uh, kind of uh, putting the role of a uh, puppet, like, uh, like when you are putting that, uh, blocking the UNSC resolution at, uh, at the point. So now it's the people's turn that now they are coming. So maybe the, it will take time, uh, not, not the change, like the drastic change, uh, but, but uh, surely we will see in the future. So, thank you. Thank you, Indu. Uh, anybody else want to chime in? Yeah. Uh, Charles. Chris, I wanted to echo uh, Ambassador Marcial's point that I think what's very key here is to note that I'm not sure that kind of the continued protests and the continued kind of civil disobedient movement is going to uh, succeed in ousting the Tamil. I think that's actually probably somewhat unlikely, but I agree that it's going to impose a ton of pressure on the regime as kind of state, the state kind of continues to fail and basic services can't be provided. This is going to kind of further hammer home the point for the Tamil. But this is not the same country it was when they last ruled the country 10 years ago. I mean, when the Tatan Madal last ran Myanmar, there was almost no internet. Mobile phones were outrageously expensive, meaning that many people were cut off not only from the world, but from the goings on in their own country's halls of power. And this is just not the case anymore. And this is something, honestly, that Tamil leaders might not even realize because they're still somewhat disconnected from some society and pretty cloistered off. So with the ground having shifted so drastically in the last 10 years, the Tamadol may not find it, I mean, probably will not find it possible to govern Myanmar. And I think the continued kind of civil disobedience movement is going to make that only more apparent. And of course, it, it doesn't help that the country remains awash in weapons marred by ethnic religious resentment with, I mean, having multiple civil wars between insurgent groups and the government for, for decades. So while I'm not optimistic that uh, the continued civil disobedience movement is going to succeed in ousting the Tamadol alone, I do think it will help box them into some kind of corner um, from which the only way out is, is negotiating with foreign powers or even kind of with uh, the opposition. Great. Uh, Mr. Amin, you know, you know, based on what you've heard so far and, and you know, some of the answers to the question that, that, that was just posed, do you see this changing the calculus uh, from Washington's uh, perspective at all as, as to you know, whether or not it, it's worth the effort to, to, to try to, to, to win Myanmar back into our, our camp and to, to help uh, you know, more vociferously? Uh, to bring it back into a, a democratic regime? Uh, with respect, sir, those are two different things. I mean, on one end, you could have Myanmar aligning away from China and more towards US, which I believe is what Takmadov actually wants. Uh, the reason why they are so close to China today because they depend on China for economically offer protection in UNSC against international sanctions. And that's because the West has not uh, reached out to uh, the Tatmadaw in the last uh, four decades. So that's out of necessity. Uh, you will have to remember that pretty much since its inception, the Tatmadaw has been fighting the Burmese Communist Party, which was one of the only two groups that uh, Mao accepted that they were providing assistance to. Uh, initially because the Kuomintang was positioned in Myanmar and then because it was Communist Party and so forth. So uh, Tatmadaw does not uh, see China as dependable allies. So they are willing to align away from them, but uh, whether de a democratic Myanmar would align away towards US, that probably is not necessary. 
uh, the Tatmadaw is willing to move towards a democratically trans uh, move towards democratic transition, but it might not be the democracy that U.S. wants. Uh, they would still probably want to retain some political capital that they have enjoyed so far. So, if the U.S. is uh, keen on winning Myanmar, maybe a win-win situation would be to contend with uh, the Myanmar reserving some political capital in exchange for tilting away from China. At the same time, those channels of communication you could probably use to naturalize the Tatmadaw into a democratic transition, uh, co-opting them and uh, gradually encouraging them to be a more democratic uh, uh, party. That, I believe, is the most likely uh, possibility. All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, Dr. Shakshina, uh, kind of changing gears here. In your article, you discuss how the triangular nexus of China, Myanmar, and Russia uh, propels apprehensions for the rise of autocracy and its impact on South Asia and Southeast Asian security architecture and regional stability. Please elaborate on Moscow's and Beijing's support for the junta. And what do these two hope to achieve from such support? How can the, and, and Related to that, how can the Quad and like-minded nations work to counter such nefarious influences? That's, that's a very interesting question. So like what I observed during the research that uh, uh, I discussed three points uh, of the diplomatic support or the support from China and Russia, that one is the ideological support. And then uh, second one is the geopolitical and third one is the economic and trade, arms trade. So I the ideological supporting that uh, uh, Russia and China, they need an ally that is, of the, uh, that is aligned to their, uh, their ideology that is authoritarianism, that is, that is discredit and disregard the democratic process and human rights. And the second one is the geopolitical. They need an ally in the Southeast Asia to, to, uh, to invest and to look at their strategic significance. And third one is the economic and the uh, armed state. So the China, let's, uh, let's talk about China, investing heavily in infrastructure, pipelines, and special economic zone in, in Myanmar. Uh, and with, with its uh, mammoth BRI project that we all know. And, uh, what China is benefiting from there, despite taking a huge market economically, and it's taking a supplier, the biggest supplier of arms and ammunition to the Myanmar, that 44%, uh, I uh, guess, like, a, yes, it's a 44% of Myanmar's import of arms constitutes China. And what China is accessing, like, China, when China importing the oil from the Middle East, it's accessing the sea lanes from, uh, from Myanmar and the uh, coming, coming and Kupu pipeline that is on, on land pipeline, it's already started over there. And when I, when I was researching that, I found that uh, China just referred this coup as a cabinet reshuffle. Yeah, we, we know that. What's the cabinet reshuffle and what's the, what's the coup? That's the difference that everyone knows that they even didn't want to recognize that it's a, that's it's an internal matter of Myanmar. And when, uh, when, the, when I was researching, I just, just finding out that how the Russia, what Russia is benefiting and what Russia uh, needs, why Russia needs Myanmar there. Yes, Russia's Indo-Pacific strategy. Russia wants a foothold in the Indo-Pacific strategy by equipping with the arms to the military junta. Russia is the second supplier of the arms to, uh, to the Myanmar. And, and moreover, like notably, in, in month of the March, after the coup, the Russian Deputy Defense Minister Alexander Komin visited the Myanmar's Armed, Force, Armed Forces Day. And that was a clear cut attempt to legitimize the military coup as well as the military junta. And the long term plan for the general, um, for the general military junta leader, that is General Hilang, to modernize the military of Myanmar, that is, that Russia is looking forward to a, a defense, a major defense partner for that. 
and that what I just observed that how the on what support the the two big powers is supporting military and for that like when I analyze that it is quite difficult for me to understand that I was struggling that how that we can uh, how the Myanmar military can can go into the camp of the Western countries or or for the for the American when when uh, I know that it's it's the uh, I can say I am saying again and repeating again to the Dr. Bird's um, statement that it's the only the people power people knows very well who is who is in their interest and when there was the coup and uh, after the coup protest some some people like the protesters they burned the Chinese factories over in the in the Myanmar we heard in the news watched in the news so that's the diplomatically support to push away the Western countries or to push away the liberal democracy that is that is uh, propagated by the West and uh, as according to the South, uh, when we talk about East and West. And then again, uh, for to the last question that uh, it propels the apprehension of autocracy. We, we have seen in the last, in the past that uh, most of the South Asian countries are illiberal democracy or the quasi democracy uh, with, with, with the strong man in the, in, the in the central government, strong man in the power. So when we talk about the, we, we saw the people's resistance against General Suharto in Indonesia we saw the um, uh, resistance against uh, against Marco of the Philippines, and uh, when we see the one party, one party state from Laos, Cambodia, Vietnam to the quasi democratic state, Indonesia, Malaysia, and we we know about the Malaysian Malaysian political structure that recently there has been some um, changes uh, in in the central government over there. So how uh, this ongoing crisis. And when we see that it, it's not about democracy and authoritarianism, Let, let's, let's not take it the debate of the authority and democrat, uh, authoritarianism and democracy. Let's take it the people's right. What about the people's right? Even a democ what, what Russia has done there with the Alexei, Alexei Navalny, the, uh, um, the uh, political opponent of there, and what happened in the, what happened in the, uh, in the Hong Kong uh, since last one and a half hour? So and and it's still going on for the for their rights. Can we ignore the suffering of Uyghurs? So how like uh, this this is all going with a with the, I think uh, I assume that is all going with the support of those countries that are that are just helping the Tadmana economically and with the arms and ammunitions. Uh, and for the like-minded partners, let's let uh, I am coming to the, the last question that what can do they. Yes, they have to raise this uh, this voice uh, uh, more loudly to, to for the people's right. They have to come forward, like Japan, like India. India has its own national interest there. I, I, I don't want to go in that deeply, but uh, I can talk on that one too. Japan, India, and America. So they have to come forward. They have to take some stringent actions, that, like. It's, it's not about make, making the people uh, more capable there and uh, to raise the voice for the people's right. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Indu. Uh, uh, Charles, you know, this, this brings up something interesting too. You, you mentioned, you know, Cambodia is, is kind of already in the, the Chinese camp. You know, if, if we see Myanmar slide completely over into that side of the equation too, what what does this do for ASEAN's calculus? At what point do they they realize the threat that set this sort of trend could, could pose to the organization itself and to the individual uh, member states if this is allowed to continue? Sure, thanks. I think it's actually an interesting point off the bat that I would actually push back against the notion that China is kind of all in on the Tatmadaw. The Tatmadaw is a good partner for them because in reality, for for years. The Tabata kind of, or China view Tabata as kind of as the Tabata is a very unpredictable organization, kind of relatively incompetent and not trustworthy. And they actually had much better relationship, they had a much better relationship with Su Chi's NLD than they did with the military before the coup. And while there was kind of a raft of media coverage after the fact saying the, the coup is a win for China, I think China's actually in a bit of a tough position here where, of course, they're saying they're kind of staying, staying away, non interference, kind of not going to condemn the coup or anything. And of course, they're trying to kind of now work with the Tabata, 
but the Talmud doesn't trust them, and China doesn't trust the Talmud. And I think this is is somewhat evinced by recent news that uh, that China reportedly told the Talmud that they actually need to keep the NLD legal. They can't elite, they can't outlaw the NLD, which is kind of a remarkable comment from China to say, well, we need you to keep the civilian democratic government or party at least somewhat alive because they're the ones who like us who have been maintaining our interests in Myanmar for a few years. That being said, if we're gonna say Myanmar becomes a pro-China country, which are in a very kind of pro-China country, which I think is possible, if not, if a little unlikely, certainly that's a problem for ASEAN for the main reason that ASEAN operates on unanimity. So Cambodia has already kind of stopped the block for years, I guess for five to six years, from putting out statements that are critical of China, critical of China vis-a-vis the South China Sea, because China, because Cambodia just blocks them, and obviously, if you have kind of a second country doing that, it's only going to further kind of water down ASEAN. But broadly speaking, about Southeast Asia, I think the countries won't be concerned about their position in the uh, kind of uh, in ge- like their geopolitical position, because again, with the exception of Cambodia, Laos to some extent. Um, and then perhaps Myanmar down the line, most of these countries understand and understand the need for and want a balance between the United States and China. I mean, Vietnam certainly tilts more towards the United States and perhaps you have a country like Thailand now tilting a little bit more towards China, but none of them want to kind of say, none of them want to kick out the United States diplomats and say, we're we're just kind of a a pro-China outpost now. There's an understanding that by playing the great powers off of one another, you extract more and more goods from both. And I think Thailand and the Philippines have done this somewhat masterfully and kind of despite authoritarian or autocratic turns, they both have kind of leaned towards China then lead back towards the United States and continue to get aid and investment from both. So I think the Myanmar's potential kind of pro-China turn, even if I don't think it's gonna happen kind of immediately in a, as kind of clear a way as it has happened in Cambodia, definitely a problem for ASEAN in that it creates more roadblocks towards actually using the organization as a means to kind of develop a regional China strategy. But it, I don't think it's going to have much of a, an effect on the governments of, say, Thailand, Philippines, Malaysia, et cetera. Great. Uh, Am- Ambassador Marcial, you, you've spent a great deal of time in, in region as, as a diplomat, uh, you know, dealing with ASEAN, dealing with Myanmar and Indonesia. Uh, is, is there a regional answer to this, or is, is it it's something that we need to look at you know, as we, we start to institutionalize the quad, for example, is that something that we can you know, kind of plug into you know, the, 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 the wish list there of, of things that, that maybe are on the agenda for that, for that organization to take care of? What do we do? You're, you're muted, sir. Sorry about that. Uh, first, uh, thanks, Charles. You made the point, one of the points I wanted to make, which is uh, certainly not my role to be a spokesperson for the Chinese government, but I, I share Charles's view that I'm not sure that the Chinese welcomes this coup at, or that they're particularly thrilled with how it's going. Because uh, among other things, the, they recognize, like everybody else, that the top model is incapable of providing the stability and, and basic governance that I think China as a neighbor would like to see. Um, Second, I think it's a mistake uh, per your question and per some of the other things. I think we need to be careful not to view what's happening in Myanmar through the prism of external powers. This isn't the this isn't the great game. Um, This is fundamentally a domestic political problem inside Myanmar in which all outside actors have quite limited influence. And so what's going to happen in Myanmar is going to be determined largely by the people of Myanmar um, and and their struggle against uh, military dictatorship. And it's not about should we be worried about Myanmar, you know, the China camp, the U.S. camp. Um, I think that's that's not really the the primary prism we should be looking at it through. and, and so to answer your question, I mean, um, I'm a big supporter of ASEAN, but they've um, largely failed to date to be able to do anything vis-a-vis this coup. Uh, I mean, partly they have a completely unwilling, if you will, partner in the junta, which is is been frankly totally insulting uh, toward ASEAN and its efforts to date. Um, I don't think ASEAN has the wherewithal to solve this problem. Uh, I had some hopes early on that they would be able to, you know, get a foot in the door and, and maybe have some reasonable conversations with the top Madal, but the top Madal is not really interested in reasonable conversations. Um, they're interested in power. 
and uh, nor are they particularly interested in running an effective and rich, prosperous, successful country. They're interested in power. Um, and so you're not dealing with people where the normal range of incentives and disincentives always work. Um, so I, my view remains that the international community needs to A, recognize that the top model is not gonna bring stability. It's gonna bring continued instability to the entire region, including through COVID and the threat of refugee flows and the like. Um, and that uh, it's necessary to put pressure on the junta, um, heavy pressure. And uh, if I could just go back to finish on Dr. Amin's earlier points, I mean, um, this isn't the place to have a long debate about it, but it's interesting that uh, there was some criticism of the US for not reaching out to the top model. Um, we've generally been much more criticized for having reached out to the top model and uh, being fooled by the top model into believing that they were reasonable and we could work with them. We actually made quite an effort uh, to engage them. But you know, the one condition we had was basically, you need to stop raping and killing your people if you wanna have a reasonable conversation with us. And they basically chose to keep raping and killing their people. Um, that's not something we're gonna ever be okay with. And so we're going to uh, bet on the 55 million people of Myanmar, not the 300,000 people of the Domino. Thank you, sir. Uh, we, we got a question from, from one of our uh, participants. Before we go on, uh, yeah. Ernst, Yes, please go ahead. Can, I, yeah. can I can I just say something quick? Um, Absolutely. You know, as much as China focus on Myanmar, right? As much as they really, I mean, they're very closely watching them. They're engaging and engage with Myanmar. They get it wrong. They get it wrong all the time. They're surprised by 2010. Now they're surprised by this goo, right? Because they always look at Myanmar through the lens of their pure uh, interest. So they have a lot of blind spots. You know, a lot of blind spots. And they want to be, they always are trying to get on the a winning side. So what really is interesting at the beginning, they assume that it's going to be like history, right? The Myanmar military is going to win, so they are all in it. Then you start to see them talk about that, you know, uh, as the progress, the NLD. Oh, yeah, you can't, you know, you can't illegalize NLD. Now, the latest thing has been they call for four parties they're hosting four party talk that is telling me that they are like oh my gosh you know they, they understand that the win, Myanmar military winning is not a foregone conclusion anymore so as what you're seeing but one I I, I do want to caution that China has been wrong about Myanmar <laughs> for you know for but for like U.S. or other country to be wrong about Myanmar, okay, you can kind of give them a, a pass because they're not really fully engaged, whereas the China is right on top of them and they still get it wrong. Uh, so, but anyway, so I just wanted to uh, uh, show that, you know, that the fact that the way they're moving and they're changing their tune a little bit from the beginning to now is telling you that they think, they also are beginning to think that the military is might not be viable anymore. Interesting. Uh, th thank you, ma'am. Uh, yeah, that's, that's, Doc, I, I, yeah, I go want ahead. To take, uh, yeah, I want to take one second here, like uh, 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 taking the point uh, uh, of uh, uh, Ambassador Marcio that, uh, like, uh, first, uh, like, uh, I humbly submit that. Uh, uh, as we say that it's not a power, it's not a game of external forces. Uh, like uh, I, I somehow it's 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 a, it's a clear clearly game of the external forces. Like if in UNSC when we see that uh, again, uh, 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 let's talk about the civil rights, civil movements. Then again, China and Russia comes and blocks the blocks the UNSC statement. And uh, and uh, like Dr. Bird said, China's unpredictable behavior. Uh, in, in not only with the Myanmar and in, in the South South Asian regions like with Pakistan with India so what is China's strategy is working as a, a China's strategy is just uh, to fulfill its national interests it's, it's not not about the people of Burma or Myanmar or not about the people of of that region I I, I just want a, a quick nod from uh, from Ambassador Marcio about the game of the big powers and the small powers, please. Uh, thank you. Look, I I I I don't want to suggest that the that big powers 
don't have angles here. My point is only that I think in terms of influencing what's going to happen inside Myanmar, it's going to be mostly, you know, 90 percent decided inside Myanmar, not by the big powers. Um, I'm, I'm certainly not going to come out and defend the Chinese government's strong support for democracy and, and the rights of man around the world. They don't have a particularly good track record on that front. So I certainly agree with you on that. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Khan, I see that you've got a question. You, you want to ask it yourself? Uh, uh, can you hear me? Yes, sir. All right, sir. I'm, I am uh, Dr. Zahid Khan. I completed my a PhD from Reading, but I'm actually speaking to, speaking to you from Dhaka, which is probably the closest to Myanmar. And uh, good to see Charles here. I've, I've, I've done some work with the King's College War, War Department. So there are a couple of things that which I, I found a little puzzling and I, it sort of validates some of the assertions that uh, my ambassador in the UN has done in the latest resolution on Myanmar, uh, that she didn't, she didn't uh, vote yes, because the entire discussion uh, seems to be sidelining one particular issue, which was a great opportunity for the uh, international community to get engaged was when the uh, genocide was happening. Uh, in, with the Rohingya people. So that was one missed opportunity. Before that, there was another missed opportunity when we started hearing uh, the concept of disciplined democracy coming in. And uh, I had a paper on this uh, in uh, Global Responsibility to Protect, uh, which published from uh, Australia, and a clear comparison of uh, how the, uh, uh, not only the military uh, assistance, which has been much talked about here, but the economic uh, uh, ODA flow into Myanmar increased very sharply uh, right after that. We should have hold, uh, held our bet and uh, sort of, and there were a lot of uh, sanctions which was removed uh, by the United States, even by the European Union. So uh, now we come back to this situation where we are in a much bigger mess with the, uh, in the context of uh, nation building or development, or development of the democracy. So quickly on, on, the, on the point, on the most important uh, question that was debated at the beginning is that what is the future of this uh, pro-democracy movement? I think there is three conditions that requires for this to succeed in the South Asian context. The first, uh, this is an internal movement. Unless there is a substantial element of Tatmado gets uh, revolves or become involved into the democratic movement, it is not going to be feasible. Second, regional support. All uh, movements of this nature, which didn't have, which was fighting against an established regime, had to have a sanctuary outside their own country. Uh, it, was in, it was true in the case of Bangladesh, uh, a country which was born in the height of Cold War because of the assistance from the India. That, is, that does not exist at this point uh, in, 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 in uh, in terms of Myanmar to some extent. And then third is of course the international communities, which is not only uh, regarding uh, the, for the legitimacy purpose or sanctioning purpose, but also stopping the flow of resources. It's not only India and China, uh, sorry, China and Russia, which is supplying the weapons there. There is countries like Belarus, uh, there's countries like Israel, there's countries like uh, others who are also open their uh, uh, baskets for uh, Myanmar. So those, concerted effort from those, uh, all those stakeholders uh, and taking the regional actors on board, uh, which has been quite frankly reluctant or not that great as of now, uh, could be the only solution to see the change that we are thinking of changing. I also don't see, uh, just a quick word about the Quad, I don't see that would be a very good option in this context, uh, uh, given the uh, Chinese hesitancy uh, because just, just the other day when there was talk of Bangladesh getting into uh, Quad, there were certain uh, reactions and Bangladesh positions was also declared by, uh, by the officials. So that's thank my you, comment. Sir. Uh, thank, thank you, you, sir. Thank you. Uh, you know, in, in the future, everybody, if I call on you, would you please you know, keep it to, to, to the questions instead of, of, of making a presentation yourself? Not, not that we don't appreciate the presentation, but, but uh, we'll, we'll schedule more of these in the future. And if, if you're wanting to do a, a presentation yourself, uh, we'll schedule you as, as one of the speakers at, at, at one of those. Uh, Tom, you've got your hand up. Uh, what, what did you want to talk about, sir? Um, I just thought it'd be interesting to draw on, we've been talking a lot about 
great power competition, which is you know extremely interesting, extremely important, and a number of our panelists are very well credentialed on it. Uh, full disclosure: Dr. Bird gave a presentation at the think tank I'm associated with uh, on Myanmar's strategic importance to Beijing. It was incredibly interesting. Uh, but I'd like to ask Dr. Bird uh, more about her article she submitted, and I'm wondering. The, the, I noted in the comments, people have mentioned it, uh, yeah, the military junta isn't a monolithic structure. And I was wondering if Dr. Bird could elaborate on the degree of representation that women have within the junta, if, if at all, um, and whether that shows any prospect of changing if they do need to, if the junta does need to gain better international recognition. Um, I'm just wondering if she could elaborate on that. Thank you. Yeah, uh, they started admitting some women, you know, into the military back in 2014, but it's a very handful and they are like young officer, you know, they think that the, the maybe the highest ranking is like a captain uh, level. So they're not really in the decision maker level. So there's no women perspective being represented in the in the military. But what gives me hope again, back to it. So we know from the organizational studies, right? When you have more women on a, into a, a, an organization, that organization outperform one uh, gender type of organization, you know? And, and they are, you know, they, there's a Harvard, a famous study said um, uh, they got smarter. Uh, groups get smarter. And so I, I, I believe that because of the women involvement, that the, 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 there, there's a smarter force out there. So it's not all firepower. It's about, you know, that, like I said earlier, creativity, right? They're bringing creativity to the, the, the group. And then also they provide that glue, glue, the stickiness needed to come together. And, and so women are providing that. You know, so, um, uh, 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 so, but on the military side, yeah, definitely there's not much other than the, their, you know, their family member, women, but uh, truly in the decision maker level that are making decisions. And then back to earlier, somebody said that um, the military, uh, off, uh, you know, the decision maker may not have all the information. Absolutely, because people will only report to them what they want to hear, not what it is really on the ground. So, even, you know, even before the coup, I was told by, you know, these uh, interview, uh, these uh, defectors, they always had some level of defection. And, but the thing is that defection doesn't get reported to the, up the chain. So that's why they keep on saying they have 300,000 people, but in reality, it's much lower because people would defect and they don't report it because they, one, they don't report it because they can get in trouble, right, for losing that. And then second is they kept the, um, they keep collecting the, 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 the salary of those defectors and they pocket them. That's how they make money. So, uh, you know, so really uh, these, uh, the decision maker level did not, um, they may not know how bad the situation is on the ground and they continue to make these decisions that, you know, um, it might not be uh, uh, beneficial or success, successful strategy on the Myanmar military side. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Mr. Amin, I see you've got your hand raised. You have a question or? You're on, you're on mute, sir. Sorry. Um, I'd just like to respond to Ambassador Masiel. Uh, well, far be it from me to defend the Takmadao. Uh, it's not my place or my intention. But the point I was trying to make was the democratic transition in Myanmar was uh, pre uh, was based on a tit for tat diplomacy between Hillary Clinton and Obama and the Tianjin government. So uh, there were certain economic incentives which were given to uh, Myanmar in exchange for taking steps towards democracy. And the Tatpana hoped that it would continue to a point where China could move away, uh, sorry, the Tatpana of Myanmar could move away from China and not be dependent on them. That, that was merely the point I was trying to make as not defending the dark matter at all. Um, and if I could answer the question, uh, which was in the chat box directed to me. Oh, sure. Uh, so uh, there's one question regarding military being uh, non-monolithic. What happened to uh, reformist minded officers like Tien Tien? Uh, last I checked, Tien Tien, I think is now a monk, he's left the military and political services, that's, 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 that's the last I heard. Um, there are still reformist minded uh, uh, officers in the Tatmada, but we need to keep in mind that there is a generation of officers uh, from say, uh, Senior General Than Shui's who have fought the BCP and the Chinese sort of um, 
uh, what do you call, uh, 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 Chinese agents or like the, the, uh, the armed organizations which are supported by the China. So these generation of officers grew up with a distrust for China and they are currently still in uh, the leadership of Tatmadaw. But slowly they are going to retire and you will be, and they will make way for a breed of officers who've seen strong military to military relationships with the PRC. So that they might have a different predisposition towards uh, China and the US. So there is a time limit on uh, uh, by when the US can leverage uh, Tatmadaw's uh, willingness uh, to either transition to a democracy or to lean away from uh, China. Uh, and uh, I think Marston made, made one point again, US has limited engagements, dialogue with Tatmadaw. Um, yeah, this was the tit for tat diplomacy that I was talking about. Uh, US, uh, yeah, I, I will not disagree with that at all. Uh, but um, like I said, Takmado uh, was hoping for more economic assistance. It was hoping to replace China as its uh, uh, replace its dependence on China, and that that was a point I was trying to make. Uh, impact of the coup on Nagaland and Myanmar, where most of the insurgent groups uh, which attack the Indian state or the Indian military, uh, they take their basing facilities in the NSC and Kaplan camps uh, in the Kachin uh, region. Uh, so NSC and Kaplang has a uh, ceasefire agreement with the Tatmadaw, whereas uh, the Kachins uh, don't at the moment. So uh, the Tatmadaw has some influence over NSC and K, although we do not know how that would play out after the passing of the leader. But still, uh, Tatmadaw is an important partner partner for India when it comes to. Uh, India's security operations against these uh, militant groups which attack uh, Indian facilities in the northeast of the country. So um, uh, th that is a reason why India would prefer stability in the region. Uh, but when it comes to a democratic transition, India would be, India has never had a policy of um, sort of trying to push for a democratic transition in any other country before. Far be it for India to try that in Myanmar right now. Of course, going in a democracy myself, that's something I would want. But my only submission is that while there is a price you pay for trying to institute democracy, as US very well knows uh, because of uh, its uh, operations in Iraq and Afghanistan, there is also a cost that is borne by the people. Uh, given Tatmadaw's intention on holding on to power, if it is pushed beyond a point, I I, presu I I presume that the violence would not uh, go down, it might escalate. So that's a calculation that Washington will have to make if it wants to further uh, this goal. Thank you. Thank you. We just have very few minutes left. Uh, I do see one hand out there though. Uh, if everyone can hold on for just a few more minutes. Uh, Mr. Assisian, I see you've got a question you'd like to ask. Yes, good afternoon. Uh, my question is, this is very short. Uh, I'm going back to the uh, Cold War, um, Spikesman theory of the Rimland. How is uh, correct that the, uh, um, because uh, because uh, Myanmar is a part of the Rimland. Uh, and so uh, how China take a lesson from the uh, Soviet Union era and Cold War era to use Rimland theory in order to break that uh, uh, kind of the uh, uh, iron, uh, iron, you know, iron circle against, against itself because, because having those areas under the uh, Western influence may definitely put uh, China under the uh, uh, restraint. Okay, uh, anybody like to tackle that one? That would be Sinologist, <laughs> just Sinologist. Well, maybe that's a question for another day then. Uh, and Mr. Sissian, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about this offline then. Uh, sure, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, I, I just want to take these last few minutes to, to thank our, our panel for a, a wonderful discussion. Uh, you, you've all brought a very uh, diverse and, and uh, deep uh, perspectives to the conversation today. And, and I know that the audience very much appreciated uh, hearing from all of you. 
Um, these are the, these series that we that, that we've started have been uh, very well attended, and I, I'm also appreciative of all of the participants who stuck through uh, this this session with us and have asked uh, you know, very pointed questions. I, I didn't really get a chance to ask very many of my own, uh, which is which is you know a very rewarding thing for a host to to be able to to look over in the chat box and see a, a lot of interest. Um, I would encourage everyone to go out there and, and read the articles that our panelists today wrote uh, for our, our special issue on uh, the Myanmar crisis, which we published last month. And uh, uh, if you have more questions, uh, they're, they're not that hard to find uh, in terms of uh, reaching out to them and asking questions. Uh, if you can't reach them, let me know and, and I'll reach out for you and, and get responses for you. I have a feeling that the, the Myanmar crisis is something that we'll be talking about, unfortunately, for some time to come. As I don't think anybody here gave us any uh, quick, uh, quick uh, solutions to the, the equation, uh, and, and I don't think anybody in country uh, that, that's in a position to make those power those choices seems to have the, the answers right now either. Uh, so at any rate, uh, thank you again for everybody. Uh, I'm going to stick around for a little bit if anybody wants to talk to me uh, and, and you know, the panelists. You're, you're more than welcome to stick around if you've got the time. Uh, we, we did this with our, our uh, our issue on um, on Afghanistan, the fall of, of, of Afghanistan, and we had some really interesting conversations after the hour. But uh, I know a lot of you got. Uh, yeah, I'm either keeping you up way late past your bedtime, uh, especially you folks in uh, uh, Australia and and uh, in India. Uh, but if anybody wants to stick around, now feel free to do so. And uh, again, thank you everyone for participating, and uh, we look forward to hearing from you again sometime soon. Aloha. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.